Thanks for joining me for this panel. We're talking today about threat modeling and what it is. Uh, with me, I have Adam Shostak, security trainer at uh, Shostak and Associates, also the founder of Shostak and Associates, and the author of Threat Modeling from Wiley. Um, I have Tanya Janka, aka She Hacks Purple, the head of community and education at SEMGRAPH and author of Alice and Bob Learn Application Security from Wiley with a very appropriately purple color uh, cover. And Izar Tarandash, author of Threat Modeling from O'Reilly, uh, who also puts the threat in threat modeling and identifies as an untrained LLM. He wrote it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for thanks for joining me today. Um, I think the, the obvious question to start out with, especially from the perspective of maybe a, a, a software developer or someone else who hasn't lived and breathed AppSec their whole career, what is threat modeling? We all want to answer. Who <laughs> wants to answer first? Apparently you do. <laughs> I don't know. Do. Help me, help me. <laughs> I, I feel threat modeling is, it's a process where you get a security person or an evil-minded person, and you have someone that's sort of the product owner or the business rep, and then you have someone technical from the technical team. And you might have a bunch of people from the technical team. It kind of depends on the system and if someone can know all of it. And you get together and you try to identify all the potential threats to a system that are reasonable. So for instance, you know, an asteroid might hit the earth and then our app will go down. So you throw those off the table. Those are a waste of time. You identify them and then you try to figure out if you, you can fix some of them, right? Like that is my goal. I don't want to just identify them. I want to avoid a bunch of them if you can. So this, this is how I describe it. What does it, I'd love to hear someone else's description. So, I like to say that threat modeling is the measure twice, cut once of cybersecurity. When, when we're building things out of, say, wood or metal or concrete, if we measure twice because the waste is really obvious and the waste in software is people's time and energy, building the wrong thing and frequently supporting the wrong thing because of application compatibility for a very long time. And so the way I think about threat modeling is we're using models, abstractions, to help us find threats, answers to the question, what can go wrong? And that's, that's really the essence of it and if I can just say one other thing, as the guy who wrote the longest book on the topic, um, here with Azar, who wrote the shortest book on the topic. Um, Mine's for developers. <laughs> it's for developers. <laughs> um, you don't have to get fancy. Just asking what can go wrong takes you a really long way. So. That was my long answer. Is our probably has a short one. Oh, very <laughs> short one. But hey, size doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> apart from what both of these great, great people uh, said, threat modeling is the thing that nobody does in the beginning of uh, of the cycle of the life cycle of a uh, a project for reasons, and that they really, really wish they had done in the end of that project for even better reasons. <laughs> Nice. So, <laughs> very succinct, very succinct answer. I, I, I'm just kind of curious. Then, are, are, are you are you implying that developers then have? Or I think he's are you you're saying you wrote it for developers? Are you implying that developers have a short attention span? Squirrel. Um, spam. Sorry, who's saying that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that they have a short attention span. It's just that uh, as we will see as we talk. Mm -hmm. Some people see it as a very costly process, doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be. And as such, they are ready to say in the beginning, hey, I don't want to invest this thing beforehand. Mm -hmm. But then when they get to the end, and even worse, when they deploy their stuff, mm -hmm. they start thinking, huh, if I only had thought about that before. <laughs> yeah, threat modeling sits right there next to 
doc writing the documentation, accessibility, internationalization, all of the out of sight, out of mind, some undefined person in the future will take care of it. Yep. Which speaking of, you know, some developers may think, well, my company has a dedicated security department. Isn't this their job? Why should I, the developer, care about this or, or be involved in threat modeling? We need their opinion. They're the experts on their app. Like, I couldn't imagine trying to do a threat model and not understanding any of the technical architecture. Like, they're literally the subject matter expert or SME, if you feel the need to pronounce it. it. Like, without them, we don't know what's going on. And think about this. So let's say the threat modelers meet without them. And we're like, we see these threats. We want these mitigations. They won't make any sense. Or I often they won't. What do you two think? I, I think that the developers are responsible increasingly for all sorts of elements of quality. And security is a quality that you want your software to have. And sometimes we as security people will know about stuff that you should care about, but you're the one as a developer who knows what your features are going to be, how they're intended to work, and thinking about what can go wrong as you build them means that they're going to be more resilient. They're going to be that the choices, as Tanya says, the choices that you make about how do I, how do I fix this problem are better than the one that someone do who doesn't understand the whole problem domain jumps in and says, you should do this. You know, for uh, there's sort of a classic pen tester example of order negative three books, right? And does that work? Why do you have to get to the point of doing pen testing to ask what happens if the number of books added to a shopping cart is, an, is negative, right? That as a developer, you ought to be doing quality and making sure that the number of books that, that you order is reasonable. And as much as I would really like for everyone to order 65,000 copies of my books, um, you probably don't need a two to the 16th field to, or an int to, to handle the number of books in an order. I want people to order 65,000 copies of my book too. Okay. <laughs> you, 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 both, you both are forgetting that ordering books is very different from paying for the order that you just ordered. So <laughs> just Once ordering, again, we need the yeah, just ordering is not that about this. <laughs> I, I would prefer to have one humble book uh, uh, thing with all of our books together. That would be better than people ordering a lot of it. But uh, to go back to the question, I, I think that it's a matter of practicality, right? We, we have two separate tribes in here that speak very different languages, have very different motivations, and work in very different speeds. So the security side of the equation is always going to work at the speed of caution. They want to protect things. While the development side of the equation is always going to work at the speed of innovation. They want the next shiny thing. They want the next shiny feature. Those two things many times clash. If you turn the threat model into a, a, a ceremony where one side finishes what they have, throws it over the wall, the other side catches it, does something and throws it back, just that disconnect in the communication is going to generate so much churn in bad communication that everybody is going to end up completely frustrated. Possibly you're not going to identify all the, 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 the threats that you actually need to. And over time, that process, that ceremony is going to become a checkbox and will have absolutely no practical value. So the idea that developers should not be, don't need to be part of a threat model to me is is one of the most absurd things that I ever heard. Mm. I, this hearing y'all does actually remind me of, of the classic uh, joke about a QA engineer walks with a little bar, Bill Simps classic joke about that, but but you know, in a different flavor, you know, that the that the 
the, the pen tester tests the door, he uses the battering ram, he uses the lockpick, he uses the dynamite, he uses the rhinoceros, and then it goes to production and the burglar climbs in through the window. It's it's it, it's it's hard to anticipate everything if you cut the developer, if you silo the developer and the, the, the QA engineer, the developer and the security team off. It's the same, the same problem, it sounds like. So if a developer's convinced and they want to get started on this uh, with 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 threat modeling, how do they begin? I just I follow the Adam Showstack for question frame for threat modeling. You don't Adam use magic computer. security dust? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's when I want to fix the thing. Then okay. I okay. security. <laughs> that's, that's only when you want to visualize the whole system. <laughs> so yeah, so for I, those of you who don't know um justin focus focus oh this is go. referring to <laughs> me having shipped actual magic security dust um for when threat modeling is too expensive <laughs> got some here somewhere <laughs> but I feel like I need to put an asterisk at the bottom of the screen here, a disclaimer. <laughs> but, but, so, 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 Adam, uh, barring rubbing um, glitter into your servers, what what is this for? This four step process. This four question. So, so the four question framework is four very very simple questions that we can ask to orient how we're thinking about a system. What are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we gonna do about it? And did we do a good job? And you can literally go, you can literally just ask those questions without any, any methodology, any structure, and you will, ask, so even asking a set of developers, what are we working on? will frequently result in very, very different views of what a system is going to be. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and so you start to get value by getting aligned, because once people are aligned, you, you reduce rework, you reduce misunderstandings. We can ask what can go wrong and, you know, my we can get into a lot of depth about how to answer the question, but I really, really want to emphasize, you don't have to. Just asking what can go wrong, a rhinoceros, someone coming in through the window, um, a meteor hitting the earth and accepting the answers and encouraging people to keep going, you get useful stuff. And if you make time for people to talk about it, they'll find ones they need to fix. I like that a lot. I I also, if you have a security person, so if you just have developers doing, doing that is good, you could add on to it as time progresses. So you start with this. And then let's say you, you do this for six months and you're getting pretty good results. You can add on more as you're comfortable. And so when I started, I started with, uh, you know, what are we doing? And also the whole, if you could hack your app, if you were going to attack your app, how would you do it? Right. And like just conversationally going through it. But then um, I learned Stride. And more recently, I learned Stripe, which is Stride with privacy added. So the P is just for privacy. And so when I work with developers, in my head, I'm thinking the S for spoofing or the P for privacy or whatever, but then I try to ask it in their language. Like, how do we know who's calling? Do we know who's calling? Can, do we validate, do we authenticate and authorize? Okay, so how do we do, oh, we're not doing that. Why aren't we doing that? Don't we care who's talking to this, right? And I slowly kind of try to hold their hand down that path. And so I think a developer over time, if they decide that there's a methodology a methodology they like, they could expand on the four questions to slowly lead lead it down. And also, at the, so I took Adam's um, training in November. It was super fun. And another thing, not to give all the secrets away, but there's a lot of whiteboards and there's a lot of drawing out of things. So I'll ask questions and I'll draw. And I'm a terrible 
illustrator. Don't hire me for art. But I can make it look sort of like a database and sort of like this and put circles and X's and stars. And I'm like, so here are we doing this, right? There are we doing that? And I find like when you show it to them, I'm like, can someone come around like this? Like, is are we blocking people from, and they're, oh crap, right? And it's just slowly walking them through and drawing and just asking lots of questions because they know more than me every time, right? And they, I don't think they, developers understand just how brilliant they are and like how much knowledge is in that head of theirs. Like sometimes, like they'll be like, oh, I'm not a security person, so I don't know. I'm like, oh, it's in there. <laughs> I just got to get it out together. Always coming from inside the house. Yeah, but we, we have to address the elephant in the room. Uh, the way that both of you approach the process, we forget to say that th that was the, the, the optimal situation. In fact, many times you're in front of developers and you say, okay, guys, okay, people, what could go wrong? Crickets, 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 crickets. Because many times either the developers think that their system is great and nothing can go wrong. And believe me, I've seen this. <laughs> or many times they don't know how things can go wrong. And that's where we get very lucky because these two, in my mind at least, are amazing educators. So we have Tanya's book, Alison Bob, uh, Application Security. And we have Adam's latest, The Threats where developers actually find security in a language that they can understand. You don't need to have a security background to get to those two. And they can start building that uh, uh, sense of what, what, what can go wrong and how things go wrong, right? Even in Adam's uh, example of the, the book of uh, the putting minus one in there. Many times I use that example and the first thing that I get, that I get back is, but why would somebody do that? Developers sometimes, even though they are brilliant, and yes, Tanya is right, they are brilliant, and sometimes they don't know how they're how brilliant they are. Sometimes I find them a bit naive. And I don't know if I'm too cynical or they are actually naive, but it's hard for them to put themselves into that mindset of what could go wrong because they don't have that background, right? On the other hand, when they start figuring out how things go wrong and then they can derive to new things, it's beautiful to see. So at the end of the day, threat modeling is two, two pieces. Is the system modeling, which Adam uh, referred to and said, all the building and discovering things as you model them. And then the threat elicitation. And that I find is usually the hardest part. And we are lucky to have material like what these two have been putting out that uh, developers can actually use. So I'm, I'm going to say, Azar, my friend, you're too cynical. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know me for what thirty years now? <laughs> uh, you know, let's let's not own up to this. <laughs> um, the 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 thing is, we've got to encourage people because they look to us as experts, as the people who should have the answers, and so they're often embarrassed to bring something up. They're often unsure about, is this a threat? Should I filter it on why would somebody do that? Um, and, and I'll just say, if you ever really want to understand what people will do, just go look at social media. <laughs> bizarre stuff that people will do for attention um, because they feel slighted. Um, people do all sorts of things. And if we remind the developers about this and we encourage them to think broadly, yeah, some of them are better at it than others. You know, we used to have quality assurance folks who were a separate discipline, and those folks tended to be pretty good at this. But if we just give people permission, and sometimes even encouragement, they'll start to find things. And I've got a whole set of silly ways to help people ranging from using like a fortunately unfortunate game from improv comedy, you know, fortunately, no one would ever do that. 
unfortunately, there's automated tools to do it. You can continue like this with fortunately, unfortunately, with card games. There's lots of ways to help people get into answering the question of what can go wrong. And, and we should, you know, to be fair to what is our said, it can be hard, yeah. I just start with examples. So whenever I'm gonna, so I have this talk I do about secure design and I go through each uh, different concept like assume breach and then I give some examples of assume breach. And then I always ask whoever I'm teaching, okay, so now give me an example. And so I always come with a bunch of examples first and then they just pile on after. And so with threat modeling, I'm like, is there money? Guess what? Someone's gonna try to steal the money. Is there sensitive data? Someone's going to want to see it that shouldn't, or they're going to try to change it or delete it because people are jerks. How else could someone be a jerk, right? And it doesn't matter if a user shouldn't do that and it's a stupid thing to do, someone's going to do the thing. So we have to put that off the table. But sometimes like just kind of giving them really ide obvious ideas at first or telling them stories of other types of threats you've found in similar systems, I find once you get them warmed up, it's like, pew, 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 pew. I'm like, wow, I, I can't even keep up. Wor worth mentioning that there are a couple of resources too, if, if you don't have uh, Tanya or Adam mm -hmm. or these are handy. One is OWASP Cornucopia, which uh, they just had a new release come out. This is version one, but where it's got a bunch of scenarios on the cards that you can run. And actually there's another card game, Adam, you're responsible for is as Collision of Privilege. And the, and both of these, you know, you can you can buy them. There are places that sell the cards, um, and it helps stimulate the conversation around threat modeling and and what can go wrong. Also, if you don't want to buy the physical cards or if you can't for some reason uh, now just came out, you can go to copi copi .org and you can play both Cornucopia and Escalation to Privilege for free online. Mm, so nice. uh, that is a really good way to get started with this too. But this is a this is a lot of fun to 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 do. This is this is what cybersecurity nerds do at parties. So games <laughs> games give people permission to be silly. When you're playing a game, it's okay to be silly. It's okay to be ludicrous. And and when people are inhibited, you know, Tanya's lure them out with examples, play a game with them. All of that has so much value. Yes. I'm working on a new game now called Cards Against AppSec, which is coming out oh, this wow, summer. Oh, nice. Ooh, and it's, cool. it's going to be more about how to vent, <laughs> venting about our jobs. It'll, it'll, but the idea of just getting people warmed up and talking about the topics and stuff. Wait, people need an incentive a... to vent? <laughs> I've been doing it wrong. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, so so let's say that you know that that that's that is um that's a lot of helpful information. Uh and a lot of developers may be thinking, cool, well, next time I'm starting a software project, I'm gonna do that. Uh but says the little guy in the corner, I'm not starting a project. I'm stuck with the 30-year-old code base and all the people that previously worked on it went insane. It's just me. How do I threat model? Where do you go from there if you're if you're working on legacy code, you know, in a team or by yourself? How, how do you handle Wait, that? Actually, before we go that, I'm going to open a parenthesis. Even if that 30-year-old thing uh -huh. does have a threat model that was done at the right time, it best to say that threats evolve all the time. Mm. So old code, old deployments should still be threat modeled for new threats. Mm. Good point. Very good point. Now I open the field. <laughs> Adam, I, 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 see I disagree. Hmm. Um, that way lies madness. And? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the challenge is you're going to threat model this 30-year-old thing, and you're going to discover all sorts of bad problems which management is not ready to deal with. And so I like to focus on, let's not make it any worse. Let's ensure that the thing that I'm doing now, the bits that I'm working on, 
the, the user stories that I'm working on are no worse because we've made these changes. And maybe at some point management will say, let's go across all of these systems and figure out which ones are the worst from a security perspective. But if I look at this and I find that it doesn't support multi-factor authentication in my 30 year co old code, or it's, there's no permission system inside the thing, so there's no way to control who's authorized to do what, odds are really good management is gonna look at me and say, we told you to make sure it accepted Unicode. You're bringing us all of the, what am I even supposed to do with this is R. So I'm going to push back on that and say that a system that's running for 30 years already, chances are that it has some pretty high value for the organization. There's a reason why that thing is still there. And if all of a sudden you find that a new vector does apply to it, it's probably worth the time to take a look at it and say, mm, are there any other supplemental controls that I can throw at this thing? Perhaps I can, I don't know, put something in between the coming and the going of the data, not even touch the 30 year old data, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a situational thing, I guess which again goes to the part where you system model before you threat elicit. So to have that visibility on code that's on, on the deployment that's 30 years old, usually will bring out a lot of stuff that either wasn't known or that you're going to identify as not known and perhaps cause some documentation to happen. So there are some second order effects to threat modeling something like that, that are quite valuable for an organization. Where do you land on this, Tanya? Go ahead. Sorry. So, when when we're looking at a thirty year old app, are we looking at so it gets passed to our team to support, or we've acquired a company that has this old legacy application, which I think sounds nice rather than geriatric. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Brownfield. So, <laughs> but but are, are we talking about like refactoring this code and rewriting it? So because I was a dev longer than I've done security still by a long shot. And so usually when I'm past something like this, I look at it and I'm like, does this need to rewrite? Does this need to refactor? And when you do that, you'd be surprised. 60, 70 percent of the app after even 10 years, turns out no one's using that. And when you rewrite, you can carve it way down. And then there's usually a couple of features customers have whined about forever that you better add or otherwise you're a moron. And then that will have a whole new set of threats. Does that make sense? And so if it's being passed to you, is it just to keep the lights on? In which case I feel like a threat model would be different than we need to refactor big parts of this. We're gonna cut, like doing some um, attack surface reduction could have a huge benefit because then you can just knock a bunch of threats off the list. So I guess it depends on, it's like, we're gonna give you two hours a week to support this, or we're gonna give you six months to make this beautiful again, like breathe new life. So that matters too. But I would say like, let's say you're doing, generally you're doing the four question frame that we talked about before, I would add a question at the beginning. So what does it do and what are, and then, so the first question is usually, what are we working on? So it'd be like, what are what does it do now? And what do we want it to start doing or stop doing? And look at those. So what can go wrong with the way it is now? And what can go wrong with these new things we're doing with it? Because sometimes you're adding functionality and a lot could go wrong then. But if you're just carving it down and just re-releasing it so it's maybe a bit more, maybe it's cloud friendly then maybe you've added some microservices because it keeps falling down all the time, whatever it is, but maybe you're just slightly re-architecting it so it stays up more often because they fall down a lot when they're that old. Not humans. 30's not old for a human. <laughs> but for code. <laughs> right. well, and something I'm also hearing that I, I feel like mentioning from a software engineering standpoint is there is, at least in some companies, 
uh, actually, I think more than than, than we realize, there is still a feedback loop. So sometimes the company can go, well, we'll give you two hours a week to manage this, but just don't touch it because it's it's super mission critical and we just don't want to mess with it. And you come back with a, with a terrifying threat model and go, by the way, we're sitting on a ton of PII that is imminently stolen if we don't patch this. Suddenly they find budget because they don't want to wind up in the press. So there is also, I think, the fact that threat modeling can be used to, um, shall we say, encourage management to make prudent decisions. <laughs> and, you know, if people are terrified to touch a piece of business critical code, there, there's a word for that, which is fragility. And if it's both mission critical and fragile, that's that's a bad combo that's scary, that's scary. i agree it is but a huge also, business risk sorry, also notice sorry. that uh, no no i'm sorry uh also notice that when you add fragility to the thing then basically you're bringing out threat modeling as a tool not only for security but for modes of failure in general Right. At the end of the day, you can say, oh, everything is a denial of service if it falls and doesn't do what, what it needs to do, and then look at it as a security thing. But in fact, you could have, let's take a, a sorry, geriatric system as an example. <laughs> uh, the way that uh, airlines do all their communication and stuff. If you look behind the console of the lady who's going <laughs> before you fly, you're going to be amazed at what you see. Because it is a very, very, very old system, which over time, people added and added and added, not only on it, but around it. These things were not designed to work on, on IP, to work on, on the networks that we have today. And we know that when they fail, well, we get a lot of people very, very sad that their travel is not working, mm -hmm. right? So the fragility that Adam uh, mentioned, sometimes it's just... Uh, 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 byproduct of things evolving the wrong way. So it's like a DNA mutation that went bad and you end up with a bad evolution, if you can call it that. I think that it has a name. I don't want to go there. But uh, that fragility is very much a problem that threat modeling should be able to point out and help solve. Yes, sometimes when I threat model, we add things to the business continuity plan or the disaster recovery plan. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. that often, but it's like, if we're not going to fix it now, then it needs to be part of that because if this goes down, so I, they're my favorite lotion company. So I wear sunscreen and lotion. I'm one of those people and they can't, you can't order lotion for the past couple months. Um, at least several weeks now, because they're having um, unplanned maintenance that they don't know when it will end. <laughs> and so they're having a security incident. Um, and the fact that like you can't order anything from their company, it's been many weeks now, because I keep checking back because I want summer is coming. I need sunscreen. Um, and There's a joke imagine, <laughs> imagine your business just all the income stopping for weeks right? And there's no plan. Yep. Uh, and so um, not to um, crap on them. I feel bad for their security team and you know who you are and you can reach out if you want, but because, because I want to order sunscreen from you. Um, but the, but the point is, is I think that like a lot of companies don't realize like how bad it can be. Like there's a bunch of famous incidents where things just go down and then all your customers are down, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And I think that when you point out these threats, like very rarely, but I have threat models where I'm like, this threat is catastrophic business over. And the likelihood is like not impossible. And that's too freaking high. Yeah. Point one percent is still scary. And yeah, I mean, see, see I also the largest, the, the two months ago, we had what the largest, we finally heard about the largest data breach in US history affecting a major insurance company, uh, which is now under investigation by the House Committee. So like this is worst case scenario meets worst case scenario. Um, and I'm sure somewhere in the background is a threat model that never happened. So to, and to, to your point. Just to add to that, uh, uh... None of us here is in the business of uh, putting out FUD, but 
a great next step when you ask what could go wrong and they look at you and like, we don't know, is to ask what's the worst thing that could possibly happen to the system <laughs> and then go from there. Mm. Because you get them shocked. Okay, I didn't know that somebody could come and just delete all the all the, the, the tables in the database. Little right? Bobby okay, drop so tables. Now let's walk that back and see what could lead to that. And then get them in the mindset in the mindset of okay, bad things happen. How can we stop that? One of the things, one of the things that I do is I ask what can go wrong and what's the worst thing that can happen, what keeps you up at night. Mm -hmm. All of these that the question is what can go wrong, not what threats exist. Because what we really care about is that something is going wrong, not yes. the human behind it, not the motivation. You know, it's getting, and everybody has something about the app. Tanya asked earlier, how would you hack your own app? Everybody has an answer to these sorts of questions. And they think, especially if we as security experts get into we're going to think about kill chains let me let me detour for 10 minutes to talk about what a kill chain is and the room will just go silent because they don't know how to take their thought and put it into our framework so they feel like they're participating but if we ask them what are you, what's the worst thing that can happen well you know we couldn't ship lotion for six months and we're still getting inventory in so we have to pay for it we have to pay for raw materials and we can't sell any of it okay well that would happen if the big mixing machine goes bad or the bottling machine goes bad what do we know about the bottling machine I would say on top of that as a threat would be, so I had to go buy the thing I wanted on Amazon. What if I get used to buying it there instead? And I don't mm. know if you know, I don't know if you've ever sold anything on Amazon, but I used to be a musician and they took 56% of every sale, not including what the record label and all the other things took. And so I used to lose about two bucks every time someone bought my CD on Amazon. <laughs> Yeah. But but I wanted to be on Amazon way back in the day. So it was worth it. Right. And so another business risk. Right. So then from then on, we have to give this giant cut to Amazon because half of our customers go there instead of going directly to us now. That's huge. So, so it sounds like yeah. threat modeling is not just what 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 is what is uh, evil hoodie villain going to do, but also what is Homer Simpson going to do? It's like it's it's you know, you're there's a lot of different threats. And it's also what what the company itself is going to do. Hmm. Yeah. So sometimes the call comes from inside the house. Yeah, <laughs> it really does. So let, let's let's say I've got my my fancy threat model and I've done I've done all that. Uh, two questions: How do I know I've done it right, and what now? Well, now's the time to bring up the threat modeling manifesto, which <laughs> everybody should go and read. <laughs> and one of the things in there is that, hey, you got a threat model. Good for you. You got value. You didn't have one before. So you already did something right. From now on, it's just hopefully upwards, right? So you start by getting value on that by itself. As to when do you know that it's done? That's a very interesting question. Do we have two more hours? <laughs> <laughs> It's the hardest question ever. It's the same with how do you know when your pen test is done? How do you know when you've done enough AppSec? Um, what I usually say is for, for how do you know you're doing enough AppSec? So it's like, we want our security posture to be this. This is like the place we would like to be. Did we do enough things to get there so that we feel comfortable with the level of risk of this system? So with a threat model, did we look at all the different pieces of architecture? Do we talk about all the different big features? Did we feel that like we didn't have a bunch of other threats on our mind that we didn't have a chance to talk about? Do we feel the conversation came kind of to an end? And then are we doing something about it? Which is, I feel the most important question, which, which Adam 
Adam promptly. So uh, his his four question framework. The last question is, did we do a good job? So he asks, where are we going to do a bit? But then did, did we do a good job? Because I've been in threat models where they're like, I'm going to accept that risk and accept that risk and manage that risk, which means do nothing. Um, and then this is and I and I was like, so we, we identified 12 threats and we're going to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> and they'll look at me and I'm like. And they're like, OK, let's talk about it again. But did we do a good job in a much nicer way than what I did? So then I started just copying Adam. Which is always a sure, sure bet. <laughs> but right? one thing that's one thing that's important for me is uh, to make it very clear to people that a threat model is not a document that you look at it, open the drawer, put it in, and forget until the next instance. Threat model is a living document. So if tomorrow morning, somebody at three in the morning woke up and said, "I forgot this thing." I'm not going to look at them and say, keep it for the next version. Put it in there. So yeah, we may be done, but we are not closed, right? So those things get, sometimes they have to marinate and people have to think about what we discussed. And it does take some time, but if it surfaces, everybody's happy. So you may be done, but not closed. So I, I want to take a slightly different tack, right? I've got this code. Is it right? True. Um, we don't usually ask that question. We ask the question, is the code good enough? Does it have the functionality that it's supposed to have in this rev? Do we meet our definition of done? And we may revisit it. And one of one of the things that people will often ask me is when when do I stop? And my answer is stop early. And that surprises a lot of people, but everybody's busy. If you stop or if if you are getting ready to stop and a czar is there saying, hang on a second there's three more threats that I think should be in this list. Nobody's going to say, I'm not saying you should slam the door, but if you say, we seem to have reached a good breaking point. Can we stop this, move on to the next thing? Then everybody comes out of the whole exercise feeling like this was valuable work and it's easier to do it again. And that requires this really, really hard thing for us as security people, which is to accept imperfection. But we gain so much by accepting that the threat model is not right, it's not complete, it's not perfect, but it is way better than the threat model that existed before you started threat modeling. And so let's celebrate the improvement. And the way that we put that in the threat modeling manifesto is that threat modeling is evolutionary. You start on a bad position, you get better, and then you add a bit more, and then you add a bit more. And what Adam said, of course, it's totally true. Because of the nature of business, when you propose to start a threat model, it will naturally be time bound. Some manager will come to you and say, hey, you know what, you want to do this? Fine, but you're asking for the time of the whole team. I can give you three hours. I can give you half a day. But at the same time, you are just teaching these people a new tool. You're teaching them a new way of thinking. You don't want to be the guy saying, let's move on, let's move on. So I try to leave the door open as much as I can for them to come later and edit the document and add to it, right? But yeah, the time boxing is definitely necessary. It definitely exists. It is a limitation sometimes, but it's evolutionary. Agree. Yes. <laughs> speaking of speaking of recognizing a really good stopping point, <laughs> this is this has been a phenomenal conversation, and I mean, I for one feel like I actually have a better handle on 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 threat modeling, um, uh, which of course means I don't. But it's it's <laughs> it's the beginning of 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 the journey, and um, so. Uh, I guess just in 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 closing uh, briefly, are there aside from aside from your fantastic books, 
uh, Izar, you just mentioned um, the Threat Modeling Manifesto. Are there any other resources you recommend people check out if they want to learn more um, about this? So the Threat Modeling Manifesto group recently added to the manifesto the Threat Modeling Capabilities document, which is something to show an organization what are the building blocks that they need to have in place in order to build their threat modeling program. Cool. Um, a thing I recommend is, um, uh, so Adam, close your ears. Adam has a site and he has the world's shortest threat modeling course and it's free. And so it's, it's nice to just dip your toe in. It's not this huge commitment. And then if you're like, that's cool, then you want to read one of the books, then you want to kind of dive deeper. And I feel like just, just dunking your toe in is first nice. Um, to see if it piques your interest. Yep. I, you know, thank you. And and the thing I want to say is, well, each of us has a lot of resources available on threat modeling. I want to recommend that people ignore them all and do a little threat modeling today. Right. Right. It one of one of the things that I see happen is people want to dive in and read all the things and learn all the things. And it is so much more valuable in my view to get a little bit of experience, get hands-on with whatever you're working on rather than looking for resources um, because you will find your, the act of doing will show you the questions you need to ask. It'll help you identify the places that you're stymied or confused. And, and this is the reason that I put the question of did we do a good job in is you, your learning path is, is the resource. And it's the guide to the other resources that you might need. Absolutely. I'll, I'll also add in there, uh, OWASP.org has a lot of uh, excellent uh, application security resources and projects and documentation as well. There's OWASP Cornucopia, again, uh, copy.owasp.org. May, may I add one more <laughs> OWASP resource? Go yeah, to the please do. OWASP YouTube channel. Mm. Yeah. It is the best there are <laughs> so all of us are on there but mm -hmm. so many people are on there and i i would be willing to bet that there's so definitely for sure at least 20 different videos about threat modeling but probably over a hundred yeah I'm, I'm gonna do the gen z or the streaming thing and go hit the subscribe button <laughs> <laughs> and it has to be said also that adam's training is a constant on OWASP events so whenever you see an OWASP event close to you at the training part, probably Adam's going to be there training. So go for it. And, and let me just mention, thank you. Let me mention, you know, coming up in Lisbon, we've got threat modeling training from Avi Duglin, who Mountain is Woods. Um, former chair of the board, I think. He's the like current chair of the board. He's the chair of the board. Of the board. Yeah. Yeah. He is the chair of the board. Okay. He totally is. Sorry, Avi. <laughs> Don't watch this video. <laughs> Cut that part. Um, oh, you meant suspended. No. <laughs> so we've got we've got training from Avi and Kim. There's a training from Michael Lodenthal. All all and there's training from me all on threat modeling at AppSec Lisbon. And so so yeah, OWASP does have a lot of great resources um at at the AppSec conferences. Oh, there's another there's another one. Um is our the mentoring thing. So if you want to oh, yeah. learn about threat modeling, you could come to the mentoring thing that that Semgrep is sponsoring. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know I can't help it. <laughs> no, but but tell them about it. So yeah, so uh this is going to be a first on uh OASP uh, uh, Lisbon and of many. Uh, hopefully and uh, we are trying to bring some more value to the OWASP membership by bringing together people who have a lot of experience, a lot to teach, not only on security, but also on career management and you know how, 
how to talk to people during the threat model and things like that. Communication, it's very important. All the soft skills that we didn't get to talk about, but are very important in security and in threat modeling specifically. And we are trying to bring these people together with people who are just beginning, just finding their way, just dipping their, their foot in the swamp. And, <laughs> and hopefully we're going to be able to get some uh, pairings going and who knows, perhaps somebody's going to get, get some value out of it. So what exactly is happening for the first time at, at the Lisbon event? What, what, is, what is the thing that's going on? So we have a list of uh, mentor volunteers with a small bio of all of them. And people can go and sort of like run through the gamut. And then we are going to have a limited number of mentee candidates who are going to play some sort of a speed dating game in here <laughs> and spend some time with each one of the mentors. And if there's a click, if people find that they think that it's going to be valuable for both parties, then uh, OWASP makes the match and it goes from there. That is, that is and do you fun. have to be physically present? Do yes. you have to buy something yeah. to win? No. <laughs> you don't have to buy anything to win, but definitely definitely be at, at AppSec Lisbon. And if for any reason you're going to miss AppSec Lisbon, AppSec San Francisco, I believe we're going to have something similar. And we got developer days yeah. coming up in San Francisco. Too. Developer day in San Francisco, yeah. And that's the one where I expect a lot of developers and security champions to come up and say, you know what, this threat modeling thing of yours sucks. <laughs> right? <laughs> Because yeah, that's the day, talk back to us. <laughs> that's the day that we are setting apart for security champions and for developers to come and tell us how we're doing. Did we do a good job? And yeah. how can we do a better job at it? Right. Right? When's yeah, developer model, day? That's going to be on the last day of training in San Francisco. So we are hoping that because we have so many developers around that area, we are going to have some good attendance at it's your turn to come and shout at us. Do it. So that's AppSet Global Lisbon uh, and AppSet Global San Francisco. San Francisco is when we got the development yeah. base going on. So yeah, ton of things. Definitely, um, if you want to learn more about this, plug into the OWASP.org community and uh, Adam. So OWASP Lisbon, June 24th through 29th of 2024. Mm -hmm. And... AppSec Global San Francisco is the week of September 20th, September, I think. Yes, I think so. Yes, and, uh, 23rd through the 27th. 23rd through the 27th, okay. So I was, I was close. Very. I was close. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. And, and since they are like uh, 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 not joint, but uh, partnering events, mm -hmm. both in San Francisco and in uh, Lisbon, we are going to have instances of Threat Mod Con, where you get to come and listen to basically everybody who does threat modeling things. Yeah, very, <laughs> to come very, and talk. very deep well of, of resources to dip your bucket into here, no matter yeah. what your what your flavor is. So. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time out to, to chat with me. This has been a genuine pleasure. Um, and um, yeah, we should do this again sometime. This was a lot of fun. Thank great you. to see you guys. Sounds great. This was fun. We should definitely do it again. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Yeah.